everyone. Uh, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the MA seminar. And it's my pleasure to host Dr. Julie Lindsay in, the, in our seminar. Dr. Lindsay is a full professor uh, in the School of Mechanical Engineering um, and the director of iDream Lab at Georgia Tech. And she received her um, PhD from UT Austin in 2007. And her research focuses on the development of methods and tools to support the early phase of the design in innovation. So, you know, her research is on um, integration of engineering design and cognitive technology, so which is a um, very interesting topic these days. Today, Dr. Lindsay will give us a talk about her research on design for human humanity challenges. Okay, let's welcome Dr. Lindsay. So thank all of you for being here, and I thank NC State for inviting me. And we're going to kind of give an overview of a few different studies. I'll go in depth a little bit deeper on one of the studies. So what my lab does, so the Innovation Design Reasoning and Engineering Education Methods Lab, I dream, uh, we really think most of the work we do is all about enhancing innovation. So dealing with very, a lot of times the very front end of the pro, uh, early design process, um, sometimes dealing with other parts of the process where there's a lot of human cognition that happens. So we'll also look at prototyping and those stages too. We look at the human behavior side of it. Uh, within engineering. A lot of my work looks like kind of psychology experiments done in engineering, with engineers. Um, almost all of my work is on how do we help engineers be, or much of my work centers around how we help engineers be more creative, more innovative. So I've done a lot of work on analogy and bio-inspired design, um, and a lot of work on measuring these processes. So that's what we're showing today. Sometimes we actually do real design projects. So this is actually some very recent work where uh, this was originally done with my graduate design class that went after a NASA Big Ideas Challenge. This is actually how I know John. Um, doing an electrodynamic shielding system for dust removal. So what you see here, this is the student's conceptual design of a brush text system. Here's some of the lab experiments you can see where we're starting to push the moon dust around. So occasionally we actually do actually do very applied work of take our innovation methods, actually uh, apply them to new designs. But I'm not going to be talking about that mostly today. I want to talk more broadly about engineering innovation. So first thing I want to talk about is show you kind of in-depth what do some of these experiments actually look like. In this case, I'm going to be showing an experiment looks, that looks at two different strategies for prototyping. On controlled experiments, you try and separate them as much as possible. So we've got two conditions We're looking at what's the impact, even though real design processes, you use a um, couple of them in parallel. I'll talk about one of the other ways you can enhance students' innovation skills, which is actually maker spaces. Again, it's prototyping, it's self-directed learning. And then third, I'm going to just highlight a couple of results of other ways that you can actually enhance engineering innovation. And I'm just curious, how many of you are PhD students in here? Oh, well, nearly all of you. Uh, so a lot of this, think about as you become faculty, you know, what are the ways in whatever your discipline is that you can actually give them chances to learn to be more innovative, more creative? It's often something we don't talk much about in engineering, uh, but I'll be talking about some ways you can actually do that as part of this. And I want to point out, yes, I deal with the very much the human behavior side, but fundamentally you have to have the engineering science. To truly be innovative, you have to know the engineering science and know how to do that. But to be innovative, we need those other skills. And most of my work is very much founded in the fact that Georgia Tech is actually a public university. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, so we have the reality of just like you guys do here. Large classes, um, often very limited TA support. The cost of education, a major concern in Georgia just like it is here. And then often you're looking at things like how do we improve inclusion, diversity, equality. Um, you know, on down the line. So that's usually the context of most of this work, you know. And that's hard to do because you can do a lot of things with innovation and creativity with one-on-one -on -one mentoring. That's great if you've got small classes, but that's not the reality that most, uh, most of us face, in the public, especially in the public universities. But first I want to talk about one experiment where I'm going to show a lot of the details of what this experimental work tends to look like. And this is about strategies to improve innovation, specifically looking at cortex and idea generation process. 
Uh, so we had a couple hypotheses that physical models within the idea generation process or within the process probably very often supplement engineers' mental models. So mental models are our internal representations of how systems work. If a lot of you remember back to physics, when you were freshmen, sometimes it was high school, Newtonian physics is hard to learn, right? It's, it's frustrating. We actually observe Newtonian physics every single day. But our, cognitively, we are very cognitively efficient. So our mental models are usually just good enough to do whatever it is we need to do, which is part of the reason that Newtonian physics is actually hard to learn even though we observe it. Because our mental models are actually simpler than that. Um, so within the idea generation process, we know, based on other studies, that's one of the things that prototypes serve. And anytime we've got engineers going in a new area or where the engineering science isn't as mathematical, when you can't define it as well, um, prototypes have a tremendous advantage there. We've also seen that times uh, they can actually prevent fixation to flawed designs because they show things that don't work. And the other thing a lot of our prior research has shown that uh, design fixation is not inherent. What actually causes a lot of design fixation we see is something known as uh, a big part of it is sub cost. Some of it is pure utility theory that you have more information about one design versus another, but a lot of it is also we see very strong evidence for sub cost, which is anytime you put a lot of time and energy into a particular direction, we tend not to like to change direction. How many of you have taught undergraduate projects where um, they're doing design? of some sort, especially building, okay, just a few of you. So you have probably observed your senior design teams that you as the faculty member or the TA are kind of like, you really need to change this. And they're like, no, 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 no. Yeah, I see the smiles already, they've seen it. Some of you may have experienced this as undergrads. And part of it is, you know, sub cost that you already put in a particular direction. Whereas your TA, your faculty member has no sub cost. They've got, they got a little bit of skin in the game, but not far less than the students do. You know, we're usually there to help, but you see that. And um, one of the things a lot of our prior research said, you probably need to be building physical models throughout the process, especially when you're in an area that they don't understand well. One of the interesting things we'd seen, though, is we had observed a, a DOE project, Department of Energy, where they were changing how solar panels are installed for commercial, industrial, and home. And uh, I walked in, when I arrived at Georgia Tech's campus, they literally called me the project, said, hey, we've got this cool project. You're welcome to come observe. We've collected some stuff on design by analogy and bioinspired design. We've heard you do design methods research. You want to take a look at it. At the time, my lab was studying the prototyping process. So we went in and looked at their prototyping. We saw them do these really weird things with parallel prototypes. We saw cases where they actually were running multiple um, different designs in parallel and prototyping them, and then feeding back and forth. And what we highly suspected is that's part of the reason that we saw this particular design team, first of all, be very successful, but secondly, they, didn't also, uh, they showed actually very low levels of fixation, even as outsiders coming in and just looking at the process. They, they switched between their designs very, very easily. And so we had looked at their process trying to figure out, okay, why is that true? Um, they had a very multidisciplinary team, so they did have some architects, some industrial designers that use uh, part of their curriculum is to teach them to keep coming up with ideas. Uh, so that we thought that might have been part of it, but we highly suspect a lot had to do with this parallel prototyping that we saw them do. And there's been other situations where we'd seen people start with parallel prototyping. In my graduate design class, I have always had them do multiple proof of concept or very preliminary prototypes. And in my design class, graduate class, I'd always seen very low levels of fixation. I had initially had them do multiple prototypes because they were doing high risk, high reward designs. And there's nothing more disheartening to students than you can see the end of the semester and nothing works. So I had them do multiple so they basically guarantee one would work. So we wanted to test this in a very controlled situation. We decided to use our freshman design class and they were in one of two situations. Either they had two prototypes that they had to give us the CAD files and we printed them and they got them back at the same time, or they did one prototype. Oops, I should have plugged in my mouse. Actually, you can't even see my mouse. Or they did one prototype, 
Then the next prototype, and in between prototype one and two, they could test. And then do something completely different for prototype two, and then the final prototype. So highly controlled. Um, we were printing everything for them because we want control. We want to be able to control when they were testing and the three D printer process. Um, so it was all outsourced for them. Uh, this was the initial. This initial experiment was originally intended to be just a pilot experiment. So we actually had the two conditions within the same class. So students that I guess assigned to the parallel condition knew that there was a error two because we want it was originally intended as a parallel as a just a pilot. What we got for data made it not a pilot, though, because it worked great. So we want to know how those different strategies compare. And based on the uh, observations we'd seen, we said we were expecting the parallel strategy to actually promote better design success, because we're expecting them just we let them do whatever they wanted with the two prototypes. So both groups could have made those prototypes very different. But the parallel group was seeing the results tend to make those designs very, very different. And it's because they tend to pick a broader piece of the design space. Uh, we also expected this group to improve what they know as engineering design self-efficacy. So it's basically self-confidence for a particular skill that what self-efficacy is. In this case, we were looking at design. We expected the more successful design self-efficacy should be improved. At least that's what we thought. And we expected them to search the design space better, mostly because you're preventing design fixation. So I mentioned before what uh, male models are. It's basically our representations of the world around us. Um, and design fixation is a tendency that once you get one design working, that you tend to stick to it. And fixation is actually the same cognitive mechanism as inspiration is. Basically, you, um, our memories are network models, our networks of ideas. Uh, you retrieve one, you start retrieving the ones close to it. The ones close to it tend to be related. They tend to be similar. So we looked at these two different conditions. Students were either in one of two, randomly assigned. Uh, because it was a pilot, we were actually within the same classroom. Normally, we would have had two different classes. But this was a first round of the experiment, so we didn't want to use two different classes if it didn't go well. Our main measures were, we had a little design competition. Essentially, they were supposed to be designing little ping pong ball uh, launchers to hit a target. We thought the freshmen could do that well. Results will show that was not the case. It's surprisingly, their mental models of how, how catapults and those types of devices work are actually really, really poor. Far worse than we expected. Plus side, as a design researcher, I now have a really cool problem that's very mechanically related that I can do lots of other experiments with. So that was pretty exciting, too, for as a design researcher. One of the most difficult problems on this type of research is coming up with a design problem. So if you've ever read kind of psychology experiments, you'll see a lot of things get reused time and time and time again. And it's because coming up with those initial problem situations, even if they're toy problems, are very, very difficult. And what a lot of psychology literature never mentions is how many problems they try usually before they get someone that works. Uh, most of my research, I've done a lot of work on idea generation. There's, we've, I think, done more, tried actually more than a dozen different problems in actual experiments. And we probably brainstormed 70 to 100 or more. So partially I got lucky with my PhD that I picked a problem that actually worked the second time, actually. The first problem I tried didn't. But. So that, that's why design problems are so important in this part of research. Uh, some of the other things, uh, we did similarity scoring. Um, I scored them for similarity and functionality. I, of course, my grad student handed me the whole pile of the prototypes, didn't tell me which conditions they were, and said, okay, here's what we need scored. Then we had another grad student score them too. We also did some survey questions at the end that we'll see. And we had a little bit of information put in their design reports. So those are some of the measures we, we did. And as I mentioned, we outsourced the 3D printing to control, make sure we had the consistent manufacturing, or at least it, the changes were randomly distributed and so I could control when they were testing, too. But what their job was, which doesn't seem that hard, take their prototype, put a ping pong ball in it, fling it about 10 feet, and hit, and hit this target. So we made a target. They've got the next hexagonal solo cups that make great targets. We gave them different points. 
and we were playing and having one of our main design outcomes being what their score was. What we really learned is they couldn't even hit the target. So our outcome ended up having to be, did they hit the target, period, or not? And they got, um, the score was the best three of five attempts. So one of the things we learned is parallel conditions significantly more likely to score points, period. So that hypothesis was supported. On the self-efficacy results, from pre to post, so what you see here, um, design self-efficacy, you've actually got four different measures. Confidence for design, motivation for design, expectation of success, and how much anxiety around design. This is a standardized survey metric done by uh, Carberry and others. But the student that really did was Carberry. One of the things you see is for the iterative group, we see no changes in any of these scores. So pre to post and iterative would be these two bars, and then parallel condition are these two bars. Now the parallel condition, you see that their, incre their confidence increases. And what you're looking at, those top bars, um, those are plus, plus or minus one standard error. So if you're doing pairwise t-tests, if the bars don't touch, it's statistically significant. Um, and on a lot of these, some of these are statistically significant, some of them are not. But that's kind of interesting is even though everybody did the same design pro problem, they did get different results, we see changes in their design self-efficacy due to it. Um, and then we also compared prototype one, prototype two, how similar are they? And when we scored these, the person scoring them had no idea which prototypes were for the iterative condition, which ones weren't. As expected, uh, the parallel condition was actually less similar. We saw them search the solution space better, which is also what we had seen on this highly innovative design team, is they tended to have a pretty broad search, and there are two lines of prototyping. We're actually usually searching different parts of the design space. So that was you know, as expected or as based on prior research. And they're just showing it statistically significant. So visually what this looks like is parallel condition. They probably put their first prototype in one spot. P2 is a prototype in the second spot. And then F is the final. So it's just a visualization of what this means. Whereas the iterative group, the blue, tends to have one, pro one prototype, another one that's quite similar, and then the final which is not uh, searching as much in the solution space. Another thing I want to remind you is we didn't tell either group that they had to produce two unique concepts. So our parallel group, they could have literally taken their CAD model, made some small tweaks to it, and handed that as a second prototype. But they didn't. They tended to make those completely different. Whereas the iterative group, they had you know, one than the other. And the other thing is the parallel group, we tried to set the timing so they all had this approximately the same amount of time. So the parallel group did have to hand in one prototype than the other. The parallel group had to give us both at the same time. We, we do know students always wait to the last minute. And basically, the less similar those prototypes are, the broader they're casting, searching the space. So on the survey, it's particularly interesting. We actually asked them how satisfied they were with their performance and which condition they were in. So if you look, the y-axis is the number of students. We had equal numbers. We happened to get lucky in this case. A lot of times that doesn't happen because students always drop out and things. And then we looked at were they satisfied or not satisfied. So if they scored points, so if they scored points, you would expect them to be much more satisfied with their performance, is what you would expect. But they weren't. Because you would expect that all those scored points to be much more, you know, you see more people satisfied. The other interesting thing is if they did score points, and they were in an initiative condition, they're still very satisfied, which is strange. You didn't score any points, but you thought your performance were good, and you were satisfied with which condition you were in. Remember, this, this class was split half and half. Um, one of my colleagues was kind enough to let us 
use her class. Very interesting, if you didn't score points in your parallel condition, then you were very unlikely to be satisfied with which condition. So there's a very much inherent belief that iterative prototyping would be more effective. And when I've talked to uh, engineers outside the design community or the design researchers, they often are very surprised by these results. And doing an innovative process is actually not better. Now, a real design process, yes, you're gonna probably want to parallel prototype in the beginning, especially when you don't understand your design space well, but you do need to fix it, at, fix it at some point to actually get a product out the door. This is really early. Uh, very interesting, we never prompted this. We asked, hey, what would you do in the future? We saw that 30 of our 45 students said, hey, I would actually use a combined process of both iterative and parallel prototype. It was interesting because we didn't prompt any of this. This was just them observing their other teammates. Um, what they didn't tell us a whole lot about that we'll probably probe next time we do an experiment like this is what would that process actually look like if you, if you did this again? Where would you put your prototypes? And where would you test? So kind of quickly in summary, first and foremost, yep, parallel condition was more likely to score points. We saw parallel condition actually increased confidence, reduced design anxiety, so design self efficacy scores were improving. Did a broader solution, a search of the solution space, again, what we expected. But what's surprising is based on the survey results, the students did not observe the benefits. Again, they were not looking, you know, we never showed them summary data, we never showed them, you know, yes, these were taking place, they didn't know which students were in which condition. Uh, but even the ones that were in the parallel condition, they did not attribute their success to the condition. And obviously at the end of class, we did show them early preliminary results, so to teach them more about this. And surprising, even though the survey results are indicating they weren't observing the benefits parallel, they, were, they must have to some degree because of, um, they said they'd use a combined strategy in the future. What we see, especially for design problems where you don't have a good idea of a solution space, where you need that build, that test, the information coming back, a parallel strategy is a very effective one to prevent design fixation, help you really learn about that solution space. And it's very typical to find that people think they have much better mental models of various engineering systems than they really do. Uh, I ask a bunch of you, how does your toilet work? All of you are going to say, yeah, sure, I know how my toilet works. Uh, but most of you, if you've never fixed your toilet, probably can start to describe some basic things about it, you know, how it works, but as soon as I start talking to you, even though all of you know fluid dynamics and a number of other factors that are really important how a toilet works, you probably can't give me the details unless you've had to fix your toilet. But there's many, many systems that's very, very true of. And it's a common finding in psychology that our mental models are very incomplete, really. We're very good at reasoning with them, though. Um, I, this is the first study. I'm going to give you guys a chance. Any questions you want to ask me? Because then I'm going to talk about maker spaces a bit. And I can always cut off some of the later stuff if we run out of time. But any questions you have for me? I'll go. How different were the solutions out of the groups if you look at them from a like solution perspective? So, you know, looking at it, did the iterative groups and the parallel groups come up with drastically different ideas? Did the parallel ones overlap in terms of like function structure with the right. iterative? How different were they? I honestly can't answer the question because I rated them all, but I don't know which one was which. Um, I know looking at the whole set of them, there were big ranges because we. We also uh, took them that we grouped them basically by the, that they more or less use the same type of solution, I guess. I'll have to ask uh, Alex Murphy that question because I know there was a big range of differences, but I don't know how much they fell with one group versus the other. We did, a, I asked because we yeah. did a similar thing in our dynamics class where we would have them launch like racquetballs. And what we found was they ended up coming to like three or four like dominant architectures, and there's two of them that are just awful all the time, where there's groups who lock in on it. And it, it's fascinating to see, so it's, it's a great question. So this is neat work. Yeah, no, it'd be, for you and I, it'd be fun to compare. Because yeah. I bet you we could get another study out of this by comparing your results with mine. And Because we've got the data, I just, and Alex I'm sure could tell you exactly. Yeah. I just haven't been asked the question, and because I didn't, you know, I, they, I was kept blind so I could create the data. Right, no, I totally understand. Never thought to ask him that. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. So in terms of the, I know you talked a little bit about the timeline of the class, but were the what's designed to for the iterative uh, teams do at the same time the two designs were due for the parallel? We set it up. Um, so the question was. I'm wondering, like, if the parallel team was influenced at all by seeing the results of the first prototype yeah. from the iterative. Uh, so we set it up so they all had about the same amount of time. Um, we did separate them by teams, so they were in teams in this class. So the prototype twos shouldn't have been able to see too much of prototype ones um, designs because they would have given us the files, taken them off, and it did work out. Uh, but I believe I believe the two prototypes were due slightly before this, the second okay. one. So we and we did. We, they knew there were there's an experiment going on, so they were asked not to talk to their teammates, and I mean not talk talk to their friends, their teammates. Right. We put the teams all in the same condition because it's too you know we knew if they were in the same condition they would talk. Right. Um, and it's just too hard to work in a team and not share that kind of information. Were there any parts of the design process that you noticed students were being fixated on, like manufacturing or type of material they should use? Yeah, so this one, uh, we didn't have a lot of details in their design process itself. They had no choice of materials. We gave them, here are your rubber bands. You are printing in PLA. Um, you have this much space, do what you want with it. And we didn't look at those, the details, but that'd be interesting to look at is, do we see ones that generate a whole bunch of ideas? Do we see ones that get themselves stuck in the CAD? Or is it also a rush that it doesn't really matter? And that might be actually, we're getting ready to run another version of it this semester. I might actually have them keep time logs of what they're doing when and promise them I will not grade it or judge them on it. Um, we just want it for experimental results because that'd be look, interesting to look at. It'd be very, it's probably another factor, it'd be interesting to look at, you know, if one, group is much more rushed because this time we're going to have two separate classes one does parallel one does iterative so it'd be a little bit different but that'd be interesting to look at and we're, we're considering double binding me which I won't even give the lectures and what my have a TA that goes between the two um, we're not sure how well that'll work because we think being a professor often I can figure out you know if I know enough about the experiment but it'd be better if I'm double blinded because I can, in the classroom setting like that, I've got my, you know, I've seen the prior data. Other questions before I? So another thing that really improves innovation is our is maker spaces. And um, you may not have a space that you call maker spaces here, but you certainly have those design build test types of spaces that are, that are around. And Yes, there's some differences of the major space philosophy that wasn't present in the curriculum before, but a lot of our de design build teams have been around for a very long time. And a lot of the similar benefits, especially when we're talking physical models, prototyping, many of the things that you're learning in those processes, I would expect to be the same in the major space as in student competition team. We haven't actually looked at that data yet, but one day I probably will. So some of this, um, what I'm going to show on these maker-based studies is it's actually a series of studies from a five-year longitudinal. We've interviewed maker-space leaders. Another one, another study we looked at where students actually learning the spaces through an interview study, and then we also, as part of that, we're capturing how they move in and through the space. And currently, we are actually looking at the tools being used and applying network analysis to look at and see if we can spot other patterns and tool usage that we can't with pure survey data. So all you're seeing here is just kind of a summary of results. So this is specific to makerspaces. We interviewed students, and these were all students that were highly involved in space at two different universities. They are actually learning a tremendous amount. So it's the first empirical documentation that they are actually learning a tremendous amount. And we found a lot of things that we wouldn't necessarily have expected either. You see a lot of um, you know, very predictable things, things about ingenuity, content skills, manufacturing, et cetera, like that. But you also see them learning the cultural knowledge of the space. You see them talk a lot about building confidence, patience, resilience, reflective learning, which is quite surprising. And we specifically looked at highly involved students because we figured if we don't find much with them, you're not gonna find hardly anything else. Currently we're in the process of taking this typology and actually turning it into a survey instrument. 
in collaboration. You'll notice almost all my work is very, very highly collaborative. Prior study was not, but nearly the rest of mine is. It's because I'm usually doing things across disciplines. So we are in the process of working um, with a couple of faculty at Purdue to turn this into a survey instrument so we can more easily manage in lots of other spaces. Things like student competition teams, make, make different implementations of maker spaces, and actually look at, okay, what will students report so um, their learning? But key takeaway for this is that hands-on building learning, those experiences, students learn a lot from them, and they're tremendously valuable. Which, yes, it's intuitive that, of that, but there was really no documentation showing that. Plus, we found a lot of things that they were learning that we didn't necessarily expect. Uh, other thing, we see students that choose to become involved in makerspaces tend to be uh, increase their design self-efficacy. So prior study we talked about design self-efficacy. And anxiety, you'll notice the bars go down, but less anxiety is better. Less stress students is better. And in this case, we, this is a university that three levels. Involved because of class or not, and then they have a voluntary level too. And we've also looked at makerspaces and idea generation. So students that are voluntarily involved in makerspaces produce higher, a higher quantity of, of quality of ideas. Not surprising. They're seeing what other people are doing, they're learning how things are designed. Another thing is if you actually do a very small printer project early in the curriculum, you can get them involved later. So we ended up, because Georgia Tech's huge, and we can't build a makerspace big enough that we can let all nine sections at 50 students piece, so about 450 students to 500 students each semester, print the parts themselves, um, we got ended up with three conditions. Uh, two to four of our classes can print in the makerspace. Uh, another group of our classes, we had the technician print them on an SLS all at once. And then, because we were just starting this, we didn't know what the benefits were, a lot of them were printed by the technician. If they got printed themselves, they were much more likely to become involved in our makerspaces. So something as simple as freshman year, you have to design a 3D printed part yourself and go print it, you can get more involved, which is kind of neat to see. Another thing we've looked at is pathways into and through the makerspaces. And what we're seeing is you, those initial catalysts are great. You know, the workshops become tours, et cetera, but generally you have to have reoccurring catalysts to get them highly involved. There has to be opportunities um, for them to become really immersed from leading the spaces to just having a high going project in the space. And of course, all of us go where we feel supported and welcomed. So you've got to have those support encounters too. I'm just skipping these. Um, so any of your spaces, I know you guys don't have spaces you call, well, call maker spaces, but on all these spaces, I expect this research to propagate there. We looked at maker spaces because they're new, the community was making a lot of really impressive claims about, hey, they're more inclusive, they're more open, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to test that, and unfortunately, they are not as open, not as welcoming as we all had hoped. Other people's work is showing that the culture of engineering is flowing into our spaces. Now, nobody's asked the question, is, there, is this culture within the space better or worse than the culture outside of it, which is a really hard thing to uh, document and measure. But my observation it probably is better. It's low bar, but it's better at least. But some of the things, any of your student spaces, anytime you can, try and make the barriers as minimal as possible. Uh, having your space located in the building where your students spend all your time is a, you know, as a minim minimizing barrier. Many times we are stuck with whatever we happen to get. This is our original door to one of our maker spaces. If the students can see in or walk in, they have a tendency to wander in. We, in one of our spaces, we happen to get glass doors put on it, and then students happen to have a study space right next to it. So everybody gets bored studying. If your makerspace is there, guess what they do? They kind of wander in and look around. So another thing is whatever your front entrance is, that easy low barrier space, ideally you want them to be able to walk in without safety glasses on. You know, so they can wander in and minimize those barriers to entry. 
make it as easy to learn some of the basic stuff as possible. Now think about events. Uh, one of the things we have also seen in our research, anybody want to guess the number one way students get involved in our makerspace? Or makerspaces in general? Most commonly reported is friends bring them in. So on your competition teams, if they want to expand, make friends. Uh, that's the most common one that we hear time and time again. There's many other ways. Some come in from, you know, if you get a number from your formal events, your workshops. These parts are really students know how to sign up for class and you know how to do a workshop. They know how to do that. And of course, you have to constantly work to push, you know, how do you make it inclusive? How do you make everybody feel welcome? How do you make everybody who's never touched a tool in their life and is an engineer because they're good at math and science, you know, come in and learn some of these tools. Uh, some of the spaces will have, uh, like our space has everything from a sewing machine to laser cutter. You know, for many people working on a sewing machine, uh, even though we have a very cool CNC embroidery sewing machine that you can do all kinds of crazy things with, they may not be comfortable with a whole spectrum of tools building that. Having student workers in there, either volunteer or paid as the front line often reduces um, your barriers. Students are much more willing to go ask another student. And uh, paying a lot of attention to who is in your space. Because you want to make everybody feel like, hey, I belong here. One of the universities we were working with, they happened to put up pictures of different students in their projects. They were trying to, I think, advertise what their students were doing, and they happened to get in the maker space. And we were hearing from the students about that made them feel more included. They saw somebody like that. Uh, so one of the other spaces has all kinds of projects. You can put the students' pictures with them, which they try and get them to, because, but they're a bunch of shy engineers, so they don't want to. But you see, even the diversity of projects. You know, everything from Christmas ornaments and Hanukkah, uh, I'm forgetting the name for the candle holder. Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you, to very traditional engineering types of things, to we have knitted projects, we have stickers, we have all kinds of things, light-up shoes. The whole spectrum um, and really showing off the student what the students are doing plus we are continuously renewing those because our students have to do them to become tool masters it's you know as the students change the projects change which is perfect so another thing to think about especially as all of you become faculty with a lot of the advancements in AI Technology, we are getting the opportunity to do things like add more open-ended design problems. So one of the things many faculty know, it'd be great if I could let my students do design problems in my class. Any of you that TA for large classes, meaning anything above 40, know trying to grade a whole bunch of open-ended design problems in most classes is horrifically tedious. That unless you have an algorithm, unless it's something that they can build a test, it's usually, you're, you might be able to do one in a course, you can rarely do multiple. This is some of my work um, with Tracy Hammond at Texas A&M. She does the AI or sketch recognition. I'm the expert on the mechanical and education side, but what her system can do is let students draw this trust. Um, this is using a tablet interface computer, and we discovered our students can draw well enough with mice, they just use the mouse for this one. You can draw any planar, Statically determinate trust. The hard part of this problem is for the computer to actually recognize it. But the computer can actually recognize it, do all the calculations in the background, and then make the student write the answer and then it can tell them if they're right or wrong. Also handy because it also means it can automatically generate new design problems for the, um, make it easier for faculty to create new problems. But as more and more technology comes on, there'll be more and more opportunities like this. And the other thing said to really improve some of the innovation is think about your thinking and the communication skills. We've done a lot of work on teaching engineers to freehand sketch. Because we've seen a lot of work in the design community of seniors that refuse to sketch unless we force them to. You're right. And being able to communicate you know, with graphics is tremendously important in mechanical engineering, in aerospace, in civil, biomedical, any of those visual um, fields. But as universities transition to CAD, they got rid of drafting, which is good, we don't need it, but there's not been a whole lot of replacements. So uh, many students are completely uncomfortable freehand sketching. 
my freshman design class, I just got down with sketching. I said, this is your last sketching assignment. About 10% of my students, like, oh, finally, they hated the sketching. So my whole goal is getting them willing to sketch. I don't, I care less about how it looks because if you've ever worked with professional engineers, many of them cannot sketch, but those chicken scratch drawings that engineers do, another engineer can actually understand. Because most of my research work is actually with a lot of sketches in that form. And I can actually pick out features um, because I'm an engineer in them. So my goal is, can I get my students to sketch? So we do actually teach them sketching. We're currently using the perspective sketching out of industrial um, design because it's a proven curriculum. But that's another thing. And we, only, we do it in, we've been doing it in five weeks. We are currently experimentally cutting the program to only three or four. Because we realize even getting that many weeks in another university is difficult. But we can see tremendous improvement. This is the five week course. Tremendous improvement in their sketching. So think about how can we develop more in engineers? Of course, you need a strong engineering foundation. Most universities are really good at that one. But there's many, many ways that we can help improve our students' innovation. If we could sprinkle that more throughout our curriculum, it would help. Um, I would say a lot of what I show here, uh, I also show off to industry and things like that about their processes also. And most of this work was NSF funded with a very large number of collaborators. One, because a lot of times we're testing at multiple universities, but we're usually coming across many, many different design disciplines, too. So questions? In uh, reducing entry, uh, barriers to entry in uh, maker spaces, how do you deal with the training aspect? I usually, in my experience, it's been a lot of come back for this training two weeks from now. Right, so training is one of the problems. So one of the things you want to think about is, is there tools that we can get on, in there with very minimalistic training? So for us, it's our 3D printers. And uh, they can literally, um, all of, we have a whole bunch of student volunteers that actually run our on space that they call prototyping instructors, PIs, which I know to all of you means something completely different as a principal investigator. Uh, but they wear, they're in the space, first and foremost, for safety, Secondly, they're there to train on the spot, um, at least the basic stuff. So sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't, but they're also doing like a more graduated training. So you can get them in there hooked on the easy stuff, the laser cutters, the 3D printers, um, depending on what other equipment you have. Sometimes it's the, you know, you basic some of your sewing machines, uh, your sticker makers, your CNC paper cutters, things like that. They're trying to do that, you know, more gradually. You can't do it all on the spot training, obviously. If you're trying to show them how to use the CNC mill, it's going to take more formal, extensive training. But think about, can we get them in there learning on their own? With COVID, we saw a lot of spaces go to videos online. We happened to take a bunch of interview data before COVID, where we actually had this, uh, many of our students talking about using videos that they could, just random YouTube ones that they could find. First of all, they did it, number one thing was usually to build the confidence. So particularly like welding, they would often go watch a bunch of videos. Uh, but secondly, they were learning a lot of skills that way too. Uh, so that, that's another thing to think about is can, you know, either put them the good resources on the video so you can build some of the training up before they actually get there to reduce it. Um, but anyway, you can reduce those barriers. And yes, there's limits to how frequently you can offer some of the more sophisticated trainings. Uh, another thing is, Again, most of us are stuck with whatever spaces you get, but if you get to design your space, think about designing it so it's more graduated. So you've got one area you can walk in, basically however our students come to class, flip-flops, etc. no safety glasses, you know, can, they, can you let them wander in, start doing, working with something, often 3D printers are one of the ones, and then graduate them into some of the other areas, and that means usually you have to wall off at least with glass walls. Uh, again, a lot of times you don't get the, uh, the luxury of designing a space. And usually even when you get the luxury of designing space, the timeline is usually so fast with so many moving parts that you get some of these benefits in and some of them you don't. Um, we built two major spaces at Georgia Tech where we had some of this research before it was being built, but again, the timelines, even though I was engaged, timelines were so fast that often it didn't get initiated. 
So uh, you show the chart that shows the um, you know, confidence level and the anxiety of the um, uh, voluntary participation of the maker space right. and the technicians thing. And here there are full uh, evaluation. So confidence and the anxiety, that's uh, more related to the um, emotion. But the real, what real important thing is the um, you know, success. So, you know, so like, how, how, how did you measure the success of what uh, so this is ex these are all this is a self-reported measure and this is expectation of success okay. and so these are all self so, um, self-reported what's their confidence in design self-reported what's their motivation for design mm -hmm. and this is our uh, Carberry's design self opinion instrument that they it's a self-report measure that they developed. Okay, so success here means that you know whether you solve the problem or not right. it's basically it. expectations. I should have, I probably, uh, next time I give this, I will have the word expectation of success, because that's actually what that measure is. Yeah, so this is purely self-report, which yes, there's lots of issues with self-reporting. Um, usually self-report is the easiest data to get, and usually once you find interest results with self-reported, then you may go over the more um, objective measure. But again, you have to develop all the measures usually. In this case, this is one of the ones that's available that I use a lot in my research. Okay. Do, you, do you collect the kind of database of the students in, the, in their performance of the, in their first career um, who has um, participated in the makerspace or not? We have not, but it'd be very interesting to see how their first career goes and doing a more longitudinal study of them. Um, right. So this is a kind of a one-time one time, uh, research yeah. study, but Know, we want to see how it um, changes, you know, yeah. changes his uh, career, in the, especially in the first career. Yeah, first job of the career would be interesting. You have to look at some of that. And yeah, we've, we've done some longitudinal studies just trying to get the freshmen to, to the seniors. Mm -hmm. And even that, when they all go through the same program, we have, I think at the time we were doing, we were about 80% um, retention rates. Because uh, with Georgia Tech, if people aren't sure if they want to do something technical, they don't go to Georgia Tech. Because we have so little else. We have other things, but it's still so technical that you're not going to, there's a lot of things you can't do, which is part of the reason we have a higher retention rate. But even trying to capture them, we miss, we still haven't figured out how we miss so many of them. Um, and partially, we, one of the issues we learned was a lot of ours take. Right, we're a lot closer to five years for graduation right from the time they go through because they do co-ops, they do all kinds of other things. They take a year off and go abroad. and That was part of our problem. But yeah, I'm capturing them to out in the working world. Actually, it depends on the universities. There are some universities that are really good at attracting their alumni. Um, so a study like that at one of those universities would be a lot of fun to do. And I think we can get high enough sample size and look results. But yeah, we don't know. But it'd be a fun study to do. Other questions? Yeah. And I'm sure all of you are supposed to be out of here at a certain time and you'll start fidgeting. You won't fidget, but you'll stop asking questions whenever that time comes. Which I think it might be up, huh? <laughs> So, do you have any, uh, you know, do you offer the Makerspace course every step, every year? Or? So, we, in our freshman design course, we have them do a 3D printed part. Uh, freshman design. Yes, but the, there's actually no course, I mean, many of our courses leverage the Makerspace, mm -hmm. but the Makerspace, we don't have a course that's specifically just in the, make, you know, how to use the Makerspace. Um, there's a couple of, I think we are now teaching the laser cutters uh, to our sophomores because trying to pull the burden off of our makerspace. And obviously 3D printing, um, we're teaching that. Well, there's, we have both FDM printers and SLS printers, which the design for the manufacturing in those two is actually quite different. So some of our students learn one or the other, and it's simply a function of we only have so much capacity. Do you see more use of makerspaces than in capstone design where students try to like since they're comfortable with those materials or those methods, or they know they can get into that space rather than go into a machine shop, they just 
Uh, our machine shop is actually right next to our makerspace. Okay. So they have to walk a whole 10 feet. Do they prototype more because they can't do makerspaces for Capstone? Like, do they try to leverage the makerspace? I think they do. Okay. And partially, they're also more comfortable, usually, already yep. when they get that. We, unfortunately, don't have the data. But it's also cyclical. Because we have a makerspace, they can't prototype more. We pick projects where they prototype more. Right. Uh, and it was actually, originally Capstone drove the need for the makerspace because they weren't prototyping at all. Yeah. I saw your question right there. So I guess I was sort of interested about like the difference between the iterative and parallel prototyping and like the level of satisfaction. I guess like, I don't know, I, 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 I guess I could see how the iterative prototyping would you sort of foster more of a sense of satisfaction because I guess it's like if you're iterating, you're seeing stuff not work, and then you're getting it to the point that where it can work is like you know engineering sort of satisfaction associated more of like you know you know the depth of knowledge rather than you know the, the breadth of knowledge, I guess. You know. So that that's a really interesting point that it might have something to do with engineering valuing the depth of knowledge, and that's part of the reason why. The iterative would feel like you're much deeper because you probably you are probably much deeper because you're doing two different design or different designs in a very small space, so your knowledge probably is deeper. That's interesting. And I haven't had anybody suggest that hypothesis before. So that's cool. I've got something new to investigate. But yeah, that could be. Um, and that's you know it's common on these types of studies that there's many many factors, and hence you see all oh, I have a lot of collaborators is because when you're talking about um, satisfaction and basically cultural norms you know that's more anthropology and so often what happens is I get a hypothesis like that if it's not kind of psychology where, where I'm deep I go grab an expert in that other area and say hey let's do this crazy study and look at this that's an interesting hypothesis it's very possible I know Many times in design, we have three or four factors that are actually all coming in at the same time. Is control as I try and get these experiments, they often, it's, it's the real world, that's what happens. How much of the grade was based on getting points for succeeding? The answer is not much. Uh, and I, I'm currently looking at it going, we're probably going to increase that a little bit. There were some bonus points, but it was not a ton. Yeah. So probably the first thing I'm going to try is increasing the number of bonus points because really the scores were so bad. We really need the scores to be better. Um, so we're definitely going to this time at least give them more opportunities to practice their designs before they are final. Because just yeah. simply practicing with your mechanism makes a big difference. Um, we're not sure if we're going to be able to let them do more trials because I've got class, two classes of 50 and trying to get all test through we have in a max of two lab periods it is unfortunately non-trivial. Uh, but yeah, that's, I guess I think it was only like two to four points. It was 10% on an assignment that is, what, about 15% of the grade. It was non-trivial, but yeah. was, I don't think it was enough. And I don't, I'm not sure the students saw that as achievable either. Um, and I've gotten lucky. I, I didn't realize this, but my TA this semester happened to be the TA in this class too. Well, I wonder if the satisfaction could be the first version was really bad and the second version did better yeah, like, could be. in, the, in their iterative, right? So like, even though they didn't score points, we made progress. Yeah, and that could be what it is too. We see the difference because they can see those are both really good hypotheses. I'm really glad I, I presented this today because I didn't know what to present. But because I'm getting ready to redo, redo another version of it, they're going to have some new survey questions. But yeah, that's interesting. That could be it too. And I think this time we need to go back and, and actually interview some of the students too. Because did they get to test the parallel or like how did that work? So they, they got to make them and then do they get to do any testing before the competition or is it pretty much? Um, so on the interview group, they would have gotten the first prototype back, been able to test it, second prototype. And then competition. Then competition. Okay. Parallel group, you get two at the same time, test, and then competition. So two all the way and then no modification. Right, they just go to final design. Yeah. So then they know that they both are awful, but there's something. Well, they can change them, because they, 
when you the, the two prototypes that they have, yeah, they yeah. can change the design and go to the final. Oh, oh okay. There's a, modi yes. there's a modification step. Yes. Okay. yes. Both conditions got modification. One okay. got two modification steps, and one other one only got one. Okay. Which also makes it interesting that the group that only got one modification step mm -hmm. still did better. Yes. Be honest. So, did they get to, since they had two, do they get to choose which one they enter the competition? Or do they get to use both? Because they have two working prototypes. Um, right, they actually get a third working prototype. They have to use their final design. Okay, so they have two, they test, then they lock in kind of on one. Right, they have two, they test, they can change their design, and then they get the final one. Okay. Yeah, so they can... Gotcha. And yes, in theory, they could have taken one of their designs and just reused it with very minor modifications. I have to look, but I think there's a fair number that the modifications to the final design aren't very big. Um, we, I know we did attempt to measure that. I don't think we got anything else significantly different, mostly probably because it's hard to get a detailed enough measure to see the differences because they're fairly small. Yeah, that's cool. Or that might be what the ASLE paper is this year because uh, there was work done with, we actually have all their CAD models. So uh, I know there was uh, coding down in the features, but I haven't seen the results yet. Did I see a hand in the back? No, okay. So, one more question. So, yeah. sorry. Um, so, but uh, in my perspective, so um, if you focus on the student learning, the knowledge, I think the, you know, iteration model, it accumulates the knowledge, and which is um, more effective to accumulate the knowledge because in parallel model it's like a random throwing a stone so so you so you know you may have a good start a good spot and then another good spot and then have a really you know get the visual by luck but iteration you have to keep consistently give the feedback and then learn the learn the principles and the uh, theory so I think that that may give you the in, in the end have a better knowledge to the students. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, and even though they kept the prototypes fairly close together, mm -hmm. um, that they tended to, it yeah, it would produce probably a deeper knowledge for that little teeny area. Uh, but it's remember we didn't force them to either. <laughs> uh, partially okay. there's another hypothesis of why. Because as soon as you get that first prototype, you actually know a lot more about the prototype. So from a utility theory perspective, because you suddenly have reduced risk on that one particular design, that could also be another reason why they didn't have to stick with it versus trying something radically different. Because most of those first designs worked at least to a certain degree, not very well, but they were, it took a ball, it, it made the ball go. I think it also is a question of what does knowledge mean? Because, yeah. like you said, Julie, you're, in the iterative process, you might be getting concept-specific knowledge, but I think from a learning outcome standpoint, you have conceptual knowledge, you have domain knowledge. You know, there's different knowledge types. So I guess the question is, what are they trying to, what's the educational outcomes? It'd be interesting to map it to that, rather than saying, what do they learn more about one design compared to another? Because again, you might learn that this design's awful but from the larger perspective of how do I launch a ball, I don't know how much in that space you really learn. So I think that that's an interesting question of how would you measure what knowledge actually means. I think you'd have to look at some kind of educational outcome. Yeah, it'd be interesting though. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you've hit on this depth of knowledge yeah. that we did not look at the first time. And now I want to go back and look at the prototypes. And they may, I think they're in the lab still. My like, gosh, you could have taken them with you. He graduated, so. And, uh, so, any other question from students? Okay, I think that uh, we can uh, wrap up the segment here. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
I was looking at the book last night. I think that would be a fun kind of start. And then kind of see what happens. I'll do that. It's got so you have you make her and then I'll you know I'll make her in at the in front of the apartment building up. Yeah, that one too. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. How's everything going? Oh, God. I don't know if you've heard yet, but we got Cur uh, Caroline Supersage joining Georgia Tech. Oh, is she really? Yes. That's awesome. Yes. She just accepted over the weekend. Oh, very cool. Yeah, we're super excited. It's good, because... So it's what you, Don... We got Roger Chow. Um, is, he, so is he there or is he like? No, he's, is he like yeah. there? Okay. Yeah, um, Dave Rosen has retired officially and gone to Singapore. Right. And we still have Burke Ross. Yeah. And Trish Sitarman. Okay. And we have a new one that's kind of split between computational materials and us, um, Emily. Um, you probably don't know her she's not in our community. Right. And it's kind of interesting when we hired her. I didn't even know we had hired her. Interviewed her. Which is, she's wonderful. Yeah. But, I'm like, okay, whatever. She's a great hire, so. It's... But that's the downside of a big department. It's a big, massive machine that works in strange ways sometimes. You get emerging properties. I need, I need a part of this strange machine. <laughs> Yeah, that's a Did you need anything? Uh,